So what we've covered on the Terrorism Act, data, um, criminal crime, uh, safeguarding of crime, and all of those sorts of things, is more than enough for what you need to know. Okay, so we're going to move on a bit here. So what we're going to look at is capacity to consent, the Gillick competence, child protection. Um, safeguarding any particular boundary issues that you need to think about and to think about what do these mean okay you need to know about these elements they might not link to the case itself in terms of the assignment um, but you do need to know about child protection and consent and capacity but what is mental capacity in all the work that you do, you need to know whether the client has capacity to consent to what they're going to be entering on. If you think of yourself when you go in for an operation, the surgeon comes and sits with you and explains to you what you're going, what's going to be happen as they're about to amputate your leg or whatever it might be. Make sure they've got the right leg, not the left leg. Okay. They're explaining to you the consequences, the possible consequences. You know, also there might be infection, da 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 da. These are processes, assuming you have capacity to understand that, to give informed consent. Okay. So the first part is, we often work from the assumption of capacity. So what is capacity is the ability to give consent to a contract okay. the person's ability to make rational informed decisions you are assessing whether that person can make that consent do they understand what they're agreeing to work with to do with you do, you have, do they know that okay. and for 90 percent of the time you're never going to have an issue around capacity. Okay? In fact, 99% of the time, you're never going to have an issue around capacity. But there are going to be occasions where you will need to think about capacity. Where do you imagine those to be? Where do you think capacity is going to enter the picture? Children, yes. Children, mental health, elderly, and learning difficulties. Yeah, and learning disabilities. More disabilities than difficulties. Okay. That just not yeah that plays a role, but it's not the lack of capacity. That's a lack of language. But it could be argued. Okay. So it is assumed that adults and children over the age of 16 have capacity. Unless there are other issues involved. The act that's involved around mental capacity is the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 and the Mental Health Act of 2007. Okay. There's no clear single test for capacity. There's no defined test that says you have capacity. It's going to depend on the context and which act you're using, what you're consenting to or for or about. Okay. So it is dependent upon the following. The ability of the person to take in and understand the information, including the risks and benefits of the decision to be made. Okay. So you are agreeing to sign up to a mobile phone contract with HTO at £10 a minute, the benefits of which is you'll have guaranteed reception at all times. The risk is you'll be bankrupt. Okay. It's that kind of element. You are agreeing to undertake therapy, to explore history of childhood abuse, the benefits are that you will 
gain some support and understanding and heal from this, but the risks are that it could destabilize you even further. Therapy for better or worse, folks. Can they retain the information long enough to weigh up the factors to make a decision? Okay. Can they take it in and process it and make sense of it? So you would say to the client, so what have I asked you to do or to take part in? If they are unable to give that back to you, they don't have capacity. Okay. They haven't been able to take it in long enough to weigh up the factors to make the decision. So a person with dementia might not remember from the beginning of the session to the end of the session. Okay. Psychosis. As well, it's when the capacity to process information has been impaired. Drugs, alcohol, extreme distress. Might be another one. Dissociation. Might be another condition. Where this could play a role. The third, is the person able to communicate their wishes clearly? Can they communicate it back? So if a person is in ICU with a tube down his throat, can they communicate clearly back? <laughs> yeah? Not necessarily, unless they're writing. So they have some way that clearly indicates. So if they're non-verbal, how are you communicating with them? Sign language, written work, an interpreter. So you're working with a deaf person. Unless you know sign, pretty sign language, you're going to be at a disadvantage. Blind, yeah. Okay. Can they communicate things back clearly? So section 2 of the Mental Capacity Act states, a person lacks capacity in relation to a matter if at the material time he's unable to make a decision for himself in relation to the matter because of an impairment or a disturbance in functioning of the mind or brain. It's very specific to the mind and brain. They, they, they distinguish between the two, the brain and the mind. Not the same thing. So if they've got brain injury or their capacity to think clearly, which is more mind and or, you know, it's the biopsychosocial type of elements, mind, body, mind split. So, they make a very clear distinction between the two. There might not be brain injury, but there is cognitive impairment of some kind due to intoxication, shock, whatever. can be permanent or temporary. A person can lose capacity temporarily. Okay. Hmm. So, when you're thinking about consent, what is being sought? Okay. Have all the potential benefits, risks, and consequences for taking or not taking the action fully understood and explained and understood for taking or not taking. So if you don't undertake X, Y, and Z therapy, the risks for taking it or not taking it are as follows. So if you don't, you are suffering from depression and you're refusing medication. A lot of people do. What are the risks of not taking medication? What are the risks if you do take the medication? Okay. If you choose not to take medication, but to just do therapy, the risk might be therapy might take longer, it might not resolve the depression, you might still need medication. Okay. It could lead to the risk that you get even worse and you end up committing suicide. You have to think outside the box of the longer and larger consequences which you need to inform the client about should that be needed. Yes. 
Yeah, they seem parrot. They seem there. They they communicating clearly. And all intents and purposes, they are with you and you with them. But actually, they're not taking it in because the amount of diazepam they're on is means they're not retaining it. They <laughs> not go go the next. Okay. Also, just in, even in in general work with some clients, I'm thinking like couples. As I'm working with couples, and where she begins saying, "No, I want a divorce." And at that point, she was really upset and angry and frustrated because she wasn't getting what she was what she was wanting. But we had to talk through the benefits and risks of taking that action, which included actually having to reflect and think about the financial implications for her. She would be a single parent with two kids, never having worked at 45 years old. That had to be made a reality. That the contract that she had signed up with her husband who was a banker was that she would never need to work and he would keep her. And now she was changing the contract to 45. There was consequences. Has a person retained the information long enough to evaluate and make the decision? Straightforward enough. Can they communicate that once it's been made? Okay. If consent is sought by another person, is the person an adult or a child? Okay. If consent is sought for another person, somebody you are seeking consent on behalf of somebody else, who are you making it for? And you can't seek consent, give consent for another adult, unless you are in parental locus of, or a carer or a guardian of the person. You can for a child. You're not seeking consent, you're merely interpreting they still have capacity. They are still giving consent, they are interpreting. They might interpret wrong, <laughs> separate issue. Yeah they can still process what's been said to them. If consent is sought to a child, does the person giving consent have parental responsibility for the child? And that is a particular legal term. So we're going to look at parental consent and Gillick competence for children under the age of 18. Okay. So what is parental consent? Uh, I think I'm repeating myself here. Autonomous decisions. Oh, this is consent, sorry. Other words, capacity. Consent, sorry, I've got a spitting headache this morning. So, consent. So, consent is the capacity to make the decisions. One is capacity, the other is consent. Two separate concepts. Uh, do they have the ability to make the decision? That's moving from capacity to consent. I'm making this decision. They make autonomous decisions for themselves, consent for another person in terms of a vulnerable adult or working with young people okay, is needed. So if you're working with a vulnerable adult you may need to get the consent of the support worker or carer but not necessarily. It depends on what is being dealt with and how bad the person's capacity is. Okay. What do they term this? When working with young people, children or vulnerable adults, consent from another person may be necessary before engaging in therapeutic work. Find a safeguard. Under the Mental Health Act, is known as the appropriate adult. Okay. So if you end up being arrested and you're in the police station and you're showing signs of not being, having capacity and being able to consent, they get an appropriate adult in, which is normally a social worker from the local mental health team, who then acts on your behalf to ensure that the proceedings are being conducted in a manner that is appropriate and you're helping ensure that this person can process what's happening with them. Okay. An adult with, with mental capacity can appoint another person to act as attorney to run their affairs. Okay. Previously called the power of attorney, now it's the capacity 
Consent Act falls under the Consent Act. Okay? So, the Mental Capacity Act creates the new one. It's called the Lasting Power of Attorney. So, it's what a lot of people put in their living will. That if I end up on a machine and I'm brain dead, please switch it off. They give the lasting power of attorney or instructions that that person will act on their behalf should X, Y, and Z circumstances happen. Okay? They make decisions on the health and welfare of the, the donor, including consent for treatment, who has lost the capacity. Yeah, so this has replaced, in a sense, the living will. Isn't that a personal choice you all have to make one day? Should you be faced with that? Hopefully not. So if they don't, it's also used for those who know they have got a diagnosis of dementia and it's in the early phases, that they make this while they have capacity, so that when they lose their capacity, the power of attorney kicks in. And they're able then to take care of their day-to-day -day affairs. But mental health is temporary. Somebody with a, a chronic condition where you know it's only going to be getting worse, like brain cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's, you know, some kind of neurological problem. So that's part of the lasting power of attorney. Yeah. Yeah. So, capacity consent made simple. So I can make it much bigger, otherwise it won't fit on the patch. Think about it, right? So you have a mental health capacity act. Has a condition of, has a person got a condition that's impairing mind or brain? They're not able to understand or retain or weigh the information? Not able to communicate? Yes or no? If that's no, then they have capacity. If you answer yes to any of these no negative statements, okay, consent to treatment, refusal of treatment, they don't have capacity, there are different elements that can be utilized. So advanced directives, okay, or later on lasting power of attorney. So advanced directives, up to date, specific to the situation, made when the patient has capacity, signed and witnessed, if treatment is refused, must include the phrase, even if my life is at risk. Which is a very dangerous thing to have lying around in a medical ward because who knows what new treatments are coming along? The next week they might actually find a thing that will kill you. And you've just said, sorry, switch off the machine. It's a risk you take. Generally, being counselors, we never face with having to deal with those decisions. For the most part. So, working with children under 18, you need to have valid consent from a parent. It's a simple blanket rule, but it's not as simple as that. Always, it's exceptions. It's a bit like the English language. This is how it's always done, but there are exceptions. <laughs> there are always exceptions to the rule. Okay, the parent is usually interpreted as meaning the biological mother and father, or adoptive parent of a child, or those who have parental responsibility for the child i.e. foster parents. Okay. Not all parents have the power to make decisions for their children. Okay. The ability to make a decision for the child depends on whether you have parental responsibility. Okay. You might not have. You might be a parent, but you might not have parental responsibility. What is parental responsibility? It's defined as the rights and duties and powers and responsibilities and authority which by law the parent of the child has in relation to the child and his property. So 
So who has it? More than one person can have parental responsibility at the same time. Okay, so cannot be transferred or surrendered, but aspects of parental responsibility can be delegated, i.e. the Children's Act. Even if your children are placed in care under the Children's Act, you are still a parent with parental responsibilities. Okay. They might be suspended for the time being under the Parental Act, the Children's Act, and for children being in foster care. Okay. But you cannot give up. Once you are a parent, that's it, folks. It's not something you can give away. Oh, I don't feel like being a parent anymore. You can't give it up. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. Which you might not have right. Depends what, under what care is he in. He's also an adult. At 30, he's now an adult. He has no right. He's an adult. It doesn't matter whether he has capacity or not. Yeah, but he's an adult. So she doesn't automatically have parental responsibility anymore because he's an adult. Once you go, turn 18, that's it. You ha the, he'll fall under the Community Care Act, the state. So who has parental responsibility? Mothers and married fathers automatically have parental responsibility for the child. In the UK, the unmarried father has no parental responsibility. They might have uh, maintenance responsibilities, it's a separate issue. They do not have automatic parental consent rights. Even if they recognize the child. If you're not married, you do not have. No. There is no such thing as a common law marriage. That is a myth. You either are married or you're not. The myth out of East Enders of the common law marriage is a community. Oh, we all see them as a married couple. That's his common law wife. No, there's no such thing. Okay. Then you're married. It's recognized. Yeah, that would be registered and recognized as a marriage. Because you're married under a particular process that is seen and recognized in terms of any legal process that will be seen as a law, as marriage. Okay, so if you're married in a church or an imam or whatever, if there's a religious ceremony of some kind appropriately where the person has been authorized to marry, because he registers it. If not, then it's not a legal marriage. Yes. Okay. So the, then you need to be aware of that. Okay. What? No. There is no such thing as common law marriage. No. They are married. No, they have to be married. That's my. That's a separate process. The idea of a common law marriage does not exist in British law. That if you are living together and you bought a house and he's bought the house in his name and he dies, you have no rights over that house. This is where, yeah. Yeah. So if 
one of her parents dies. Yes. She gets everything. The other partner is not entitled to anything. In my case where my wife and I, we were living together, we had bought a house together. I have no kids. If I died, everything went to my parents. Because yeah? the, the idea of common law marriage does not exist, people. Okay? So unmarried fathers can acquire parental responsibility in three ways. Okay? If you consent to be named as the child's father on the registration of the child's birth, does not operate retrospectively. You can't go and add the name in afterwards. Yeah. If you are the named parent on the birth certificate, you have a parental right. Even if you're not married. Yeah. No, if the father is recognized at birth, not the child. <laughs> Well, and his name is entered on the birth certificate. If the name is not entered on the birth certificate, then you've got a problem. Can you pass it back to Wendy? Okay. You can't add it in. By a formal parental responsibility agreement signed by mother and father and witnessed by court and registered. So that's for couples who are working. Who, who have agreed, who are living together and coming together to work on it. That's like a civil partnership. Yeah, it's retrospective for this bit. They missed that out. Oops, we forgot to do that. Then you can do that one. But it has to be in court. And basically what the court will say to you, why didn't you get married? <laughs> okay, when would... It, when would a couple do this. Yeah. So an estrangement. They separated. Yeah. Not three. Yeah. Can be around those things. Hmm. Or that they're not a couple. They've had an affair. Mm. One night stand. Oh dear, accidents to happen. Okay. He's married. Okay. One night stand that haunts you for 25 years. Yes. Court orders parental responsibility to be to him consistent with the interests of the child, i.e., basically the child is placed in foster care with the father. Yeah. So if they audit, those are the three ways. On the birth certificate, by agreement, always ordered by the court. Okay. Can also be acquired through a residence order directing the child to live with the father, being appointed as the child's guardian, marriage to the mother, or adoption of the child. Okay. So the, the unmarried father can the child's order to live with him, similar to that one. They get appointed as the child's guardian. The child doesn't necessarily be living with him. They get married to the child's mother. You automatically become father. If that, you are the biological father and you get married, you become the father. Okay. Or you adopt the child. And the adoption leads to marriage. child automatically, you be automatically become the parent. None, unless he adopts the child. So when you're a step parent, you're not, you do not have parental responsibility. They're not your child. That is often assumed, but you don't. 
They don't have the, capaci the ca capacity to consent to that child undergoing an operation unless they've adopted them or been ordered by the court to be the guardian of the child because the child's real biological father isn't around or incompetent or whatever. They can't have it together, no. Yeah. As a stepdad, you don't have, in terms of the parental responsibility rights, specific term. Yeah. yeah. Only by uh, for having this, the stepfather adopt the child. They can't just give them up. You can't give up your rights. The only way you give up your rights is through saying adopt. I don't want it. Then, the, then he has no parental responsibility he has n and he's not allowed to see, have contact or engage with the child. That's it, it's cut off. When you give up for adoption, that's it. Now, there's more open adoption processes these days as well. But uh, in the old days, it was absolute. But that's the only way a stepfather can gain parental responsibility over a, a stepchild is through adoption. Yeah, same, same process. So what is Gillick competence? It's a term that's used quite frequently, thrown around. Okay. Think about what is Gillick competence is what we're going to explore. The Gillick competence is about children becoming active decision makers in their own lives. Okay. So this is applying to children. Anybody under the age of 18 is considered a child. And that's where the confusing element comes in is that we have this two-year gap, 16, 18. At 16 they have certain entitlements and decisions they're allowed to make, but they're not considered an adult. And we're sitting in a sort of grey area. Or can they, or can't they? Okay. They can make some decisions, but they can't enter into contracts. Yeah. <laughs> you can see mobile phone contracts yeah. through the room. <laughs> Children are no longer seen as possessions of the parents or adult caretakers. The child is a person, not an object of concern. And that was the shift in the law and the, the, the focus. That, that these little mini-me's are not your possessions. They're a person. They have a personality and they exist and they have the right to make a decision. Hmm. And that's how child rearing has slowly changed over the years. You know, seen and not heard. Now it's heard and not seen. <laughs> okay. So the rights for consideration to as an independent party in 30 years, acknowledged by the Gillick decision in the House of Lords in 1986. Under Article 12 of the Convention of Rights of Children, 89, section, and Section 22 of the Children's Act. So you've got three lots of legislation that give children capacity to begin to make decisions. And these have had major, I think, consequences for how schools engage with kids, how parents have to engage with children, um, and how people working with children in any therapeutic or medical sense have to think about it. It's a bit of a minefield and you don't know when it's going to explode on you. Okay. So what are the rights of children? Right to welfare, to education, health care, protection from abuse, capacity to, to de right to participate in decision making, to have a direct say in decisions made about them, on about them or on their behalf by courts, social services and child protection conferences. They have to have their say in these proceedings. So no longer can you have a child protection conference and the child is not included. Any age. 
the child has to be included. They have a right to be part of the decision-making process. And it has to be brought down to a level of understanding. And the, the process will take into account their age. If they're a five-year-old or a 13-year-old, who do you want to live with, mommy or daddy? Five-year-old will be one thing. Thirteen-year-old's decision will be another thing. And that will also be taken into account. But they have to be included. The right to autonomy. It them to autonomous decision-making to take legal action on their own behalf via an advocate. So a child can hire a lawyer if he's got funds to pay for it. Or a lawyer can be appointed on their behalf if needed. Okay? Hence the famous case in America where the child sued and divorced his parents. Okay. So it's important to promote autonomy. And that's the important thing about this one. Okay? As therapists, we do need to promote autonomy to avoid paternalism. Okay. We are not their parents. We are the therapists. We promote autonomy with children. You do not make decisions on behalf of a child in therapy. It will come back and bite you. You are not a parent. The Gillett case resulted in the right to confidentiality for children and young people under the age of 16. They have the right to confidentiality. Okay? They are capable of making certain decisions for themselves without requiring parental knowledge or consent. Okay, so what was the Gillett case? So in the Gillett case, was a young teenage girl went to her GP and requested the pill. Contraception. Okay. And she explained to the GP that her, she and her boyfriend were already having sex. So, 16. Okay, and they were already engaged in sex. And the GP erred on the side of caution, saying, better safe than sorry, and gave her the pill. The mother found out and hit a gasket. She blew the roof off because she was Catholic. Contraception is taboo in Catholic Church. Okay? And that was the grant that it had gone against her religion. And she demanded, how could the GP treat her without her consent? She's a child, etc., etc. And this went to court. And the courts came to this, what came known as the Gillick Competence, where supported the GP and the child in being able to make that decision. She had consent. She had capacity to make a consent. So she knew what was going on. She knew the implications of it. She knew the risks. That's why she went to the GP. She knew the risks of having intercourse would, could result in pregnancy, which she didn't want, so she was being proactive. Yes, you did. And that's part of what the courts looked at. It was looking at as a grown-up decision. That the child can make the decision to undergo a medical treatment if they understood the risks. Okay? Now what you'll hear are two phrases. The Fraser Guidelines or Gillick Competence. They're not the same thing, though they're interrelated. Okay? And there is a reading up called the Fraser Guidelines or Gillick Competence that explains that difference. So have a look at that one. So the Gillick competence was originally subject to the Fraser guidelines, that the young person will understand the advice, refusing to allow their parents to be informed. It is in their best interest that counsel be given without the parental consent. Okay? That the treatment, I've just traded it into counseling there, be given. It's in their best interests. Okay? A, they understand. They are refusing for their parents to know, and it's in their interests. Or the phrase of guidelines. Yeah, or well, the person working with them. It could be a doctor, it could be a social worker, whoever. It could be a teacher. Yeah. I, do they understand the advice? 
No, you can't tell my parents. I, you're under 16, I've got to ask for parental consent. No, I don't want them to know. It's point blank. No, there's not. Counseling, yeah. Still best interest, doesn't matter. You still have to hold. Right. Okay. So. Hmm. There is no age. As long as it's necessary. There is no minimum age with the Gillick competence. Twelve? Yeah. No. That's the counselling process that's required. Do they understand the implication about yeah. making that going on? That's the phrase of guidelines. There's no age, minimum age, maximum age. It hasn't been set. The youngest age from what I've been able to find in which Gillick confidence has been applied is 12 for an abortion. Yes. Maturity isn't defined by age. Maturity is defined by, again, you're looking at those two elements, capacity and consent. Do they have the capacity to understand and process it, and can they give that consent because they know what's going on and what the risks and benefits are? Okay. Whereas the Gillick competence moved it to a broader capacity. Okay. The Fraser Guidelines was linked specifically to medical treatment. Gillick competence moved it to a decision process making allowing the child to make decisions in a broader level. So, uh, so that was Gillick competence. So health conversion to treat child without consent is an emergency under parental neglect, abandonment or inability to find a parent completely disappeared. Crucial difficulty remains when deciding how to assess whether the child is, has sufficient understanding okay, for Gillick competence. So this is the kinds of situations where you might want to utilize it, but don't forget that third one is if the child refuses even though the parents are around. And I had that when I was counseling at a, the school in Guildford. 16 year old, wanted counseling, didn't want her mom to know what was the issue. She was trying to decide whether she was gay or not. Her parents were staunch Christian and she knew they would constantly we'd be absolutely horrified and against it. As well as being, they were very private, you said they, they wouldn't give consent for therapy no matter what. Yeah. So I saw it. She understood. And it came out later on to as all of us will eventually. But my therapist says, and she said, what therapist? <laughs> In an argument. <laughs> so it does come out at some point when working with a child under the age of 16, it will come out because they're going to use you as part of their defense in an argument somewhere with a parent. Okay. So be aware and that it will come. You will have an enraged parent on your doorstep. <laughs> yes. Yes, they complained to the school. They made a formal complaint to the school. And I had to justify the grounds for it. And the school backed me. She was in a doing her A-levels. You know, she's more than capable. <laughs> Law isn't fair. Okay. Uh, so we've said that they're entitled to confidentiality. The lower or cut off age, uncertainty, it's, it's not as young as 12. There's wide professional opinion what's appropriate ranging anything from 10 to 14 years, so there's no clear fixed, people argue, but it really comes down to the child you're working with, the context in which you're in, the situation that you're dealing with, will all determine whether you begin to think the child has a capacity to make the decision for what they need to do. Okay. Um, you need to understand your rationale 
and be able to be presented to court. On what basis did you make the decision to see this child without parental consent? You need to have that clearly documented with your reasons and evidence, otherwise you might have trouble down the line. And what I did with my 16-year-old is we did it in writing, and she signed it. That she understood she was making the decision to enter therapy without informing her parents that if her parents knew they would refuse her therapy, because that was what she was saying to me. You know, so we documented the reasons why, and we both co-signed it. Keep yourself safe, people. In all cases, you must try and persuade the child to allow their parents to be consulted and to give consent. So you might need to see and explore why are they refusing. There might be re good grounds. There might be irrational grounds. Okay. Unless the child has refused or where the child is at risk of abuse. If by asking for parental consent is going to put the child at harm. Okay. So the child comes to you, you're working in a school, the child comes to you and wants to talk about what's happening at home because daddy comes home drunk every night and loses the plot. Okay. To say, Dad, we need consent for therapy. What's the therapy about? You. <laughs> Not going to happen. You know, he doesn't want that coming out. He's too embarrassed, shamed, angry, frustrated, whatever it might be. So, there can be times when you do explore things. But when you're in that kind of situation, you'd also be reporting that to the child protection officer within the school. Often, I had those situations where the child protection officer was bringing kids to me to say, this needs to be spoken through. Okay. So, the value lies in helping the therapist decide whether to work with a child when there's apparent conflict of interest between them and their parents. Okay? So there was a further one. Got challenged. Get a competence, got challenged and was upheld. And this one established a test by which the court can measure the child's competence with authorizing medical treatment. But there are a number of ambiguities. What must be understood for them to be deemed competent becomes the question. At what point in the consent process should competence be ass processed or assessed? Does competence conf confer on minors the authority to refuse as well as to accept medical treatment? I, child's got cancer, but he doesn't want to go through with that treatment because it's just so horrible, does he have the right to refuse and understand the implications? Hmm. Well, it might be. That's really what it's coming down to. It's not only to you for treatment, there's also to say, sorry guys, I don't want this. They're not easy questions, they're not easy answers with these. Okay? So, the Mental Capacity Act might be a way of playing. So, have a look at that reading. It's up. Oh, my brain very slowly today. I've got a lot more than I thought. So, there's a consent sort of process. So, child protection. Is based around the Every Child Matters agenda. Five outcomes of Every Child Matters are these elements. Be healthy, be safe, make a positive contribution, enjoy and achieve, and help achieve economic well-being. Those are the goals of the Every Child Matters agenda that all local authorities, schools, health authorities, education have to implement. Hence you have the healthy schools meals around the Be Healthy campaign. What do children want from professionals? It's not what we think they want. 
give time to make decisions. Often the children are rushed. They take longer, it's slower, you've got to break it down more. Don't rush them. Be kept informed. Listen to what they have to say. Just because you're listening to them, it doesn't mean you, ha you follow what they're asking. But they need to feel that they've been heard to begin with. So, we've touched on safeguarding before. So, protect, the safeguarding is around protecting children from maltreatment, prevent impairment of children's health and development, which is basically saying avoid, prevent neglect. To grow up in circumstances with provision of safe and efficient care, undertaking the roles of those enable to live optimum life chances and enter childhood, adulthood successfully. These are global, broad policy documents. They're not law. Okay? These are policies. Every Child Matters agenda is a policy, not a law. So if they're not meeting these, they're not breaking the law, they're breaking government policy. Very different process. So safeguarding is a separate element. These are safeguarding, they are legal elements. So there's a mismatch between child protection and safeguarding that resulted in the Every Child Matters agenda. So child protection is part of safeguarding and promoting welfare. Okay, protect the child who is suffering or liable to suffer significant harm. So, there's a guide to working together, the Working Together Safeguarding Guide, Children and Young People's Plan, What to Do If You're Worried, National Framework, Common Assessment Framework, Safeguarding Children. These are all the documents that go with safe Every Child Matters Agenda. That's a lot of documentation, people. Lots of conflicting <laughs> elements and processes. Child protection is a really difficult area. And this is the legislation that is also involved with children and child protection. Children's Act, the Education Act, and the subsequent Children's Act. So there's a raft of information and stuff out there that is just incredibly conflicting and confusing and difficult to process. That wasn't children. <laughs> So, abuse and neglect, fairly straightforward, we know, okay. Stranger danger is the least of our worries around abuse and neglect. It is often the people most close to the child who is abusing or neglecting them. Okay. The stranger danger makes up, I don't know, even 10% of child abuse. Most child abuse and neglect happens with children that they know. Either Adults stay together or by other children within the families. And all sibling on sibling abuse is more common than you realize, people. And cousins, yeah. Uncles. Okay. Mm. So you have different categories of abuse and neglect physical, emotional, sexual, and neglect. You're all aware, become aware of the broad signs of abuse. You're not going to see it directly, it's indirect, people. You'll pick it up indirect way. These are possible indicators where you need to be aware of where abuse might be happening. Okay. Highly mobile families, so they keep moving. What are they running from? And that's where people fall through the net. They move from one authority to another and so they fall out of area networks under child protection issues. Okay. So. These are your more vulnerable groups, you know, obviously babies and disabled. My wife works at a local primary school who run a profound a PMLD, Profound Motor Learning Difficulty Unit, and that's something they have to keep constant awareness of the children who are at risk. Of. So why don't children tell? Lots of reasons why they don't tell. What do they do if a child tells? That's very important. 
what did they actually say? Not what you thought, not what you've interpreted. What did they say to you at the time? Okay. Sign and date the record. Take it seriously. Reassure them they are right to tell. Explain what will happen next. And it will depend on the context in which you're working. School, health, private, whatever. Okay. Don't ask leading questions. Don't make promises. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't speculate. And it's not your responsibility to investigate people. That's the local authority child protection team. Common assessment framework covers all the elements. It's a huge case conference that takes place and deals with a whole range of elements. So just that you're aware, aware that it exists and that you might have to attend a common assessment framework conference. Um, got to be out of time. Have it, Jenkins. We've touched on safeguarding before, so have a look at the safeguarding issues. That you're aware of them. Uh, yeah. yeah. So let's have a look at the safeguarding. We just to be aware of safeguarding and what is involved. We have talked about it before. The main thing is about the vulnerable adult. That's from the Birmingham Council's posters around safeguarding vulnerable adults. Uh, Leonard's friend invited himself in now and refuses to leave. Jenny said her best friend touches her and she must keep it a secret. Uh, that's the second time Dave's boyfriend said it was an accident. They've got people for vulnerable adults. Have a look at them. Uh, look at the principles. Understand what DBS means and why Father Christmas couldn't come.